Glad that you are here. It's good to see some faces we saw last week, a couple others that at least I didn't see last week. And uh, if you are new here, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here at Dolphin Way. It is our privilege to be able to uh, be here to gather everyone, to gather everyone who is online with us today uh, for the second session of the Journey to Freedom class that Frederick is so graciously uh, agreed to lead us through. Grateful to everyone who. I heard last week about the, the early beginnings of Methodism and about some of the work, the, the first mentions that we had of uh, folks like Richard Allen. And uh, today we get to take the next step into the next era and into the uh, further establishing of uh, the Methodist movement here in uh, the United States. And what a privilege it is to have Frederick here teaching us and guiding us through those sessions. As we did last week, uh, we have uh, sheets of paper available for questions. As Frederick's leading us, we'd love for you to find a pen, write down any questions that you have at the end of the session. We'll take those up, and I'll use those for the Q&A as well as a few of my own questions and use those to, to tease out some meaning and uh, give, give Frederick the, the opportunity to both answer your questions and answer a couple other uh, for each question. So uh, what a privilege it is to have him here to be gathered with you for us to grow and learn together. As we get kicked off, I'd love to open us in prayer, and then I'll turn it over to our esteemed lecturer. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for a warm place to come out of the cold. For the reminder that we didn't make all this up. Yes. But that everything we know of you, we know because somebody told us. Someone took the time to proclaim your name. Proclaim it in moments when others ask them to be quiet. To make sure that your glory continue to echo through the ages. We pray now that as we listen and attend and ask the questions that are on our minds and our hearts, that you would awaken us to even more of what you've been trying to say all along. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It's all yours. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, afternoon, everyone. We kind of rearranged it somewhat so I can be down here. You can see the full screen. And I was told that people would rather see my face as opposed to my profile as I'm talking. So I brought my computer this time so I can look down at the screen as well. We're, uh, our pace will be a little different this time. I wanted to lay down some foundational information last time. So at, when I move from one phase or stage to another, I will pause, and if you have a question at that point, you may want to ask it at that point. So what I want to do now is pick up where we were last week. Let's, are we ready, Trey? We can go to slide 30. This is, we, we'll call this part two, even though it's still part of part one. But the, since we have four sessions, we still want to call it part, uh, part, part two. The question was asked last week, and we want to talk, deal with this briefly here, is that Methodists advanced three themes which Americans found captivating. It's basically three themes which Americans found captivating. That uh, was God's free grace, which was not something that had been really presented or discussed. Uh, mostly when people came to the New World, it was kind of a, a, an election, predestination, a thing of that sort, uh, and more Calvinistic. You gotta keep in mind a lot of the uh, sex that were developing within England and Church of England. But this was God's free grace. It was not based on class, status, uh, gender, or any of those things that we use to create lines of demarcation. Then it was the liberty of people to accept or reject this grace. It's God's free grace, then there's the liberty to, to accept or reject it. And then the third theme was that there was the power and validity of popular religious expressions by servants, because keep in mind when people first came to to these shows, many were indentured servants, and they could, after a period of eight, seven years, work themselves out of that servitude, and women and African Americans. Uh, the role of women had not been fully established, and so therefore women were in a subjugated, submissive uh, role, and then African Americans, it's, it's critical to understand at this point, we use the word African American today, but at that point, they were just referred to as African blacks, or just African, because they were, they were being brought from Africa. So these, these terms, black and white, and America had not been developed at that time. All right, make sure I got this right. 
Methodism. There we go. Good. Methodists were and are pace sellers from the point of view of popular mobilization. This has been a trademark of our presence in the New World since our coming to, uh, coming from England, coming from Africa and other parts of the world, is that uh, pace sellers, a point of popular mobilization, effective communication systems, and the participation of women and the empowerment of African Americans. Next week, or the week after that, when we get to the separation that occurred uh, when the Planet Union in 1939, we will discover that it was women, black and white, who pioneered or came up with the concept that we have one church and reduce the segregation in or the apartheid system. Uh, we, we'll spend a lot of time on that. Women, back then it was known as the Women's Society for Christian Service. How many of you have been around that long? Jamie, don't raise your hand. <laughs> How I many of you all remember it was called the Women's Society for Christian Service? Amen. Thank you. Now we call it what? Uh, uh, Jamie don't say that. United Methodist Women. But back then it was called the Women's Society for Christian Service. And that group uh, developed ways by which they crossed the lines of demarcation and separation and met and carried on uh, activities that brought us together. In, in 1791, this is what we're going to deal with, the African presence uh, in 18th century. In 1791, there were roughly 11,680 African Methodists. And their numbers increased until they accounted for almost a fourth of the total church membership by 1797. 1791, there were roughly 11,680 African Methodists, and those numbers increased. By 1861, the Methodist Church contained roughly 210,000 Africans. And this information is documented in two different books, if you have opportunity. Oh, by the way, hopefully you picked up this document, uh, Lessons of the African-American Presence. I think we should have some more of those. And in that, on the back, I've added a reading list. Most of this information comes out of these two books. Uh, you can see this one is worn. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's called Black United Methodist Retrospect and Prospect uh, by J. H. Graham, and the other one is uh, the Black People in the United Methodist Church with it. I go is by William B. Bobby McLean, and these are two great books to help us understand the presence of uh, the African American presence of Black presence in the church. So uh, that's a part of your reading. List. Africans preferred separate services because they could worship away from the watchful eye of slave masters, slave holders. They enjoyed the freedom in speaking, singing, shouting, and praying they could not enjoy in the presence of their masters. Uh, I think it's about several weeks ago, uh, Trey and I did some promotional materials for this. And as I was coming in to do it, we were in the, what's the name of the room with all the bishops in? Is that the McGowan? Or? Mm -hmm. hey, Whose room? Hey, That's it. I knew it. I knew it had somebody there. <laughs> we were going in the room, and I was on the phone with a, a friend of mine in Daphne, and we go back and forth about whether or not I'm a country boy. And I was telling him, he said, no, you're a small town country boy. I said, no, I'm not a country boy. I said, you know, I didn't work on the farm. I come from a small town. And so we go back and forth. And then I said, no, no. I said, you're trying to say, you know, that whether I'm a, a field Negro or a house Negro. And so, um, all right, all right. So Tracy, what was that what y'all talking about? I said, well, Tracy, and I had to, then I realized that somebody else was listening in on the conversation. <laughs> so I said, how do I break this down to Trey? So that I won't, you know, reveal too much. I said, well, Trey has this, um, that's this way that, that we exist. I said, some African blacks worked in the house and some worked in the field. And because of that, uh, people saw that as a distinction. I say, now keep in mind, those who worked in the house, unbeknownst to their masters, aided those that worked in the field. I said, my mother wouldn't allow me to work in the field. That's why I was the youngest child. So I learned a lot of skills of working in, 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 in the house. However, I did, once I got married and I couldn't get housework, I had to work in the field. <laughs> I had to dig ditches and things like that. I said, so that 
that point of distinction has been something that we kid one another about back and forth, whether you are a house Negro or a field Negro. And I said, you know, that distinction goes back and forth. So that's, um, that's an interesting dynamic because people thought that, the, that there was a separation in them. And then I sh share with Trigger, I watch a lot of uh, recycled TV. Oh, I watch a lot of westerns and things from, from the 60s. I had to get my hour dose of the Beverly Hillbillies in the morning. <laughs> but there is this episode on, 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 on Big Valley. Now, I forget the guy's name who's the, uh, who works in the house. The, the guy, uh, he's from, uh, uh, from Mississippi, Whitey. And he works for the Barclays. And there's this episode where Lou Rawls is a is a is a cowhand. Wait, I bet. How many of y'all have heard of Lou Rawls? Okay, you know who. So Lou, I just wanted to make sure my well, wife said you talk all this stuff. Nobody knows what you're talking about half that. So now Lou Rawls comes in and he is a, a he he is a master uh, rodeo person. And uh, the guy that works for Barkins is so excited about it. And uh, Miss Audra is talking to him. And he said, um, he was looking in the book trying to find out was he listed as one of the great cowboys. And he tells her, he said, well, you know, Ms. Arthur, a lot of ex-slaves came to the West and they became cowboys and blah, this. And she said, and, and he said, oh, have you talked to him? She said, oh, Miss Arthur. He said, I admire him. He said, but you got to understand, we're different. And she said, what do you mean by that? She said, you know, because she was saying, well, aren't all of you all Negro? That's what she was saying. And, <laughs> and he said, well, you got to remember, he worked in the field. <laughs> and I am of the house. I've always worked in the house. He said, y'all been good to me. He said, but he's restless. He's been in the field. And he's angry, man. He's, you know, he's, he, he, and that's a difference. He said, you know, we don't talk, but we understand each other. It's an interesting lesson. Did y'all get that? They enjoy the freedom of speaking, singing, shouting, and praying that they could not enjoy the presence of their masters. Even when segregation forced or when even when segregation, whether it was forced or volunteer, took place, it is possible that the Methodist Church approached the salvation through a marked and often traumatic conversion experience served as an equalizer. Whether you were in a forced segregation or volunteer segregation, it is possible that the Methodist approach to salvation through a marked and often traumatic conversion experience served as an equalizer because the rich and the free had no greater access to heaven than the poor and the, and the enslaved. Because of this traumatic conversion experience, it became an equalizer. It didn't matter whether you were rich and free or whether you were poor and marginalized. It did not give either side great advantage to enter the kingdom. Methodists, Methodism could be used by both free and enslaved Africans to make sense of the world and help create a more humane way of life. So you, we begin to see, keep in mind, we are in the late 1700s. And this, this, this movement is providing people, regardless of their station or status in life, the opportunity to enter into God's grace and to be a part of God's kingdom building. Because they, at that point, realize that there comes this moment in our life that it doesn't matter whether we're rich and free or enslaved and poor. At some point, we all will end up in the same place. So we need to find a way to improve our existence here on this earth. Methodism provided an intellectual and ritual link between the two worlds known by the enslaved Africans. The emphasis on the spiritual deliverance was appealing and beneficial because of the implications of physical freedom. W. Du Bois expands upon this concept of this two worlds that Africans live in, or Negroes today, blacks live in. Uh, he called it a double consciousness, that at one time we were one at the same time American, then we were one at the same time Negro. There's this dimension that goes on that we have to walk in two worlds and people have to be aware of that. The emphasis on spiritual living was appealing and beneficial because of its implications for physical freedom. Some Methodist ministers, including Africans who had greater access to pulpits in Methodist meetings, 
made an effort in their sermons to speak to the sufferings endured by Africans. Some preachers spoke to this condition of one being enslaved and one not being enslaved. When we get to uh, Charles A. Tinley, who has written a lot of hymns, uh, there is a part of our experience that we would talk about, you know, I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. When we get to hell, we're going to put on our shoes and shout out all God's help. So no matter how, what the condition or status that you were living on the earth, when we get to the other side, equality will reign supreme. Some would call that compensatory theology. We, we might be denied, you know, what our, what our unalienable rights are here on earth, but when we get to heaven, we will see God as he really is. I think Paul talks about that, you know. Though we look through, look through a glass dimly, but then we will see him face to face. Francis Asbury believed the work of Methodists should destroy the system of slavery. Francis Asbury believed that the work of Methodists should destroy the system of slavery by restricting membership to those who did not hold slaves. In other words, he felt, keep in mind this is late 1700s, the beginning of the 19th century. Keep that in mind, lock that in mind. That. Early on, Francis Asbury believed that the Methodist story could destroy the system of slavery by saying that only those who do not own slaves could be Methodists. I just want you to put that in your pocket this morning. <laughs> Perceived as threatening to the economic welfare planners, these efforts by Methodist ministers were met with wide resistance. Can you imagine it? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't seem real, does it? Assumed connections between Methodist teachings and slave revolts fuel this resistance. Many within the Methodist Episcopal Church made peace with the slave trade system because in the long run, the mission of the church was to preach the gospel to every creature, Negro as well as white. This position early on, as Asbury had, became a threat to the economic welfare plans. So then, the connection between Methodism and teaching and slavery was fueled resistance so that the Methodist M.E. Church, M.E. Church, made peace with the slave system because in the long run, the mission was to preach the gospel, not set people free, just preach the gospel. Thus the notion of common redemption or spiritual freedom for all did not mean freedom on earth. Methodist preachers reconciled their concern for enslaved Africans with demands of slave owners, holders, by emphasizing the saving of souls irrespective of the physical body's faith. So there was this dichotomy created that we're here to save your soul, but not to end your enslavement. Hmm. It's a separation, a dichotomy. We're here to save your soul so that you won't go to hell, but when you leave here, you'll go to earth. I mean, when, you, uh, when you leave here, you'll go to heaven. But while you're here, you're still going to be a slave. Interesting. All right, let me stop right there before we move to the, uh, let me go back. Any thoughts or questions on what we presented so far? What I'm doing is just laying down what's getting ready to happen now as we move to the creation of the different, the breakaway groups that went into Methodist Church. Any, any thoughts or concerns at this point? Okay, good. That either means that you have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> or you'd rather not talk about it. One or two, which is a good thing. The African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is also known as AME Church or the AMEC Church. You'll see it listed some ways as an acronym, AME or AMEC, which basically stands for African Methodist Episcopal Church, also known as the Freedom Church. The development of the African Methodist Episcopal Church draws together both the experiences of freedom and slavery, which is demonstrated by the life of the founder of the denomination, Richard Allen. Allen was converted in, in 1777 
and he was encouraged to enter the ministry. Allen purchased his freedom after the conversion of his owner by working for Howe off of the plantation. In other words, he was hired off of his plantation or he found ways to, to, to be contracted to do work off of his plantation. Short, shortly after he secured his freedom, Francis Asbury and other Methodist ministers gave Allen preaching opportunities, including one at St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia, where Asbury first preached in America. In 1787, Allen and several others developed the Free African Society as a mutual. In 1787, Allen and several others developed the Free African Society as a mutual aid society to address the full range of needs of African Americans, which were not being addressed in regular church gatherings and social opportunities of Philadelphia. This benevolent organization helped provide moral guidance and financial assistance as part of Christian life. It helped people that were in financial distress. It helped them uh, acquire loans, small loans. It helped them in their burial plans. It helped them in getting their children's education. That's why I was known as a, uh, as a uh, 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 free African society, a mutual aid society. It assisted people when the church was unable to do that. Because keep in mind, they are still under the wings of a particular church. And now we are beginning to witness how they're going to be segregated in that worship experience. The rapid growth in the numbers of African worshipers, keep in mind, see how the words are being used, African. The no rapid growth in the number of African worshipers, St. George's Church, propelled discussions of issues charged with implicit racism such as where should Africans sit and how should they participate in the service? Where should they sit and at what point do we allow them to participate in the services, the sacraments, and the ministries of the congregation? In 1787, when African members were physically removed from praying at the altar, they withdrew from the church vowing never to return. As we said last week, uh, that you have two schools of thought on this. Some would say that Adam and others were illiterate and they were told that they didn't understand what the sex and other issues were sharing with them. They thought that they misunderstood the direction they were told to go in the balcony and they thought that the altar was the balcony so they went down. Other schools of thought is that it was an intentional act since they, they had accepted God's free grace. They believed in God's free grace. Francis Asbury shared with them this, uh, this notion that the way to deal with slavery is to continue to emphasize uh, God's grace and to restrict membership to non-slave holders. So they felt that they had allies at St. George's Church who believed that it was now time for all of us to come together because that's what the Bible talked about. So we have these two schools of thought. So that it was a deliberate act on their part to go to the altar and participate fully in the worship services at St. George's Church. What started as a society to supplement the inadequate assistance received from whites became an African church. Debate within St. George's continued until 1816 when legal action, the Methodist Episcopal Church, sued when a white elder was denied the church's pulpit. This worked in the new church's favor freeing it from control of ministers appointed by St. George Methodist Episcopal Church. Make sure I didn't miss it. Okay. <coughs> Notice the question was last, last week when they separated, what, was it a, did, what, did they exclude anyone? No, they did not exclude anyone. Their, their services were open, but they wanted to have their own preachers in their pulpit. They were still under the auspices of St. George, but St. George wanted to assign who would do the preaching because of the notion that these societies uh, may be fueling unrest, dissension, and revolt, and the rapid uh, abolition or abolishment of slavery, there had to be some internal and external control on it. So that was the debate that went on. So it became to the point that St. George's Church sued them 
and the suit worked in the favor of the new church because it freed them from the control of ministers appointed by St. George's Methodist Church. Most of the society members who formed the, who formed the African church held an interest in joining the Church of England. But Adam convinced them plain doctrine and good discipline were best attainable through Methodism. Beholden to Methodists was the phrase. He and others purchased an old blacksmith shop and turned it into a place of worship. In 1794, they were removed in 1787. They continued worshiping. In 1794, Francis Asbury dedicates this facility that they have converted into a church as Bethel Church. And Adam was ordained by Asbury in 1799. Keep in mind, the Methodist movement in America became officially started during the Christmas Conference of 1784, number 23, 24, and 25, Asbury is ordained a deacon, elder, and then a bishop. Richard Allen and Harry Hoosier are present, but three years later, segregation occurred. They create their own society. Now keep in mind, all African blacks did not leave with that group. Some of them remained with the St. George's group. So now Asbury and others, uh, they dedicate the new facility and then Adam is ordained in 1799 uh, by Francis Adler. As the church continued to grow and receive word from other societies in New Jersey, Maryland, and other surrounding areas, where African Methodists experienced similar hardships and sought ways of freeing themselves from religious and social constraints. It is rather interesting that many of these churches uh, began to, at, well, in their construction, the balconies were created for the Africans, or the exterior or the outside of, of the nave of the sanctuary. I think I got that correct. This is where the Africans would sit, or in the back. But as many others, because keep in mind, Methodism is having such a hold on Africans that they see it as, a, as, as the best option to come to know God and Jesus Christ. So the growth and the, and, and the spread of it is so phenomenal it's moving so fast and rapid, because keep in mind, we're dealing with the, the, what is called, I think, historically as the first great awakening in the American continent. This is the first great awakening. So these are growing so fast, and, uh, but other churches are experiencing the same thing, other people are experiencing, other groups are experiencing the same thing, having the same joy. So these common issues and worries resulted in these various congregations uniting under the banner of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia on April 9, 1816. This became the first African-American denomination founded in the United States of America. Their leaving the Methodist Episcopal Church was not based on a doctrinal disagreement. They chose to use the Methodist Episcopal Church's Book of Discipline, but strengthen its anti-slavery stance. You need to keep that in mind. It was not a doctrinal difference because they, they, they appreciated and affirmed what was being said. And they continued to use the Methodist Church's Book of Discipline, but they strengthened its anti-slavery stance. During the first general conference of the AME Church in 1816, Daniel Coker was elected the first bishop. However, he was more interested in missionary activity in West Africa. Thus, Richard Allen was elected in his place and served in this capacity while pastoring Bethel Church in Philadelphia. And that's something. You're a bishop and you're pastoring a church at the same time. The Book of Common Concern, today known as the Sunday School Union, developed in 1818. It became the first publishing house in the United States created and owned by African Americans. In 1818, the first publishing house in the United States created and owned by African Americans was the Book uh, Concern Department, or today known as the Sunday School Union. And it's interesting that for years, our publishing house, the United Methodist Publishing House, built on the Cokeberry Avenue Press, and the AME's publishing house were on the same street in Nashville, Tennessee, and around the corner was the Southern Baptist. Publishing house. That's all. All this is in natural. Wonder what natural has going for. Let's see. 
Daniel Payne did more to increase the educational emphasis of the AME Church, Daniel Payne. His efforts eventually resulted in the founding of the AME Church's Wilberforce University in Ohio in 1856. Question, Wilberforce University is named after who? William. And William Wilberforce was who? And what did he and John Wesley have a discussion about? Isn't that something? <laughs> At first, Wilberforce was for slavery, and John Wesley, in the letter we shared with you last week, shared with him and called it the inexorable villainy, the scandal of religion. And because of his change of position, he, he, he changed his position on slavery and put forth the bill which became the law where the Commonwealth of England abolished slavery and the importation of slaves. And in that regard, the AME Church named their first university in America after him. That's interesting, isn't it? For many whites, this focus on education combined with the claims of independence marked the AME Church as a dangerous organization. See, like I've heard that before. <laughs> because they combine education with independence. They marked the AME Church as a dangerous organization. In addition, slave rebellion such as the one in which AME Minister Morris Brown was implicated closed most plantations to evangelists, particularly evangelists from the North, whose very presence could spark ideas of freedom. Until the Civil War, AME ministers were more active outside the Deep South. They were, because they were folks on education and independence, they were marked as a terrorist organization. I'm sorry, they were marked as a dangerous <laughs> organization. In this one. The development of the AME Church in the South was not strictly the result of AME efforts to advance the kingdom of God on earth. Many white congregations encouraged African members to leave and join the churches better suited for them. For many former slaves, joining the AME Church was an opportunity to exercise freedom and liberty long denied. Now keep in mind, this was what was being said in around 1820 to 1840. I grew up in the northern part of the state. I tell people I ain't from around here, I'm from up north, <laughs> Kate, Alabama. And I came into the ministry, uh, I would tell you this long story, but I went to Adams College because they had one scholarship available, and it was in something called Ministry of Science. I couldn't spell Ministry of Science. But um, they said, you know, you got to, you know, to get a scholarship, you got you to do Minister of Science. And the, the guy that was talking to me, uh, Curtis Coleman and I, because I, I was uh, about five or six weeks away from being arrested, taken to jail, for inciting a riot. All I said was the official was cheap. I remember inciting a riot. <laughs> when they tried to arrest me and they you know, read all these charges against me, and, you know, I quoted the Constitution, Mao Zedong. Uh, you know, I talked about everybody but Jesus. And, uh, and I, I just told them I wasn't going to jail when they got ready to put the handcuffs on. You know, you know there's a point in which the handcuffs click. I just put my hand between, I get handcuffed, I ain't going to jail. And they said, why? I said, you better look around. In the words of Red Fox, there was enough Negroes that'll make Tarzan movie. It was on two police. <laughs> but anyhow, I didn't go to jail. But at the same time, continue the story, I discovered that there was a movement in the North Alabama Conference, for a moment so, that superintendent, a particular superintendent, whose name I won't call, he's not related to none of y'all in here, but he was encouraging churches in the, in the late 1970s and in the, in the 1980s, why don't you all just leave and become AME? I'm telling you, this, 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 this mindset was still going on. Why don't y'all leave and become AMEs? You know, why don't you know? Because, in other words, they saw those of us who never left the Methodist Church, the sons of Harry, as being some kind of drain on the resources. 
And when I heard of this, I couldn't believe it until he suggested it to me one day. And I said, I can't tell you what I really said. It's not Christian. I said, wow, because I was got you know, my second time going to college, I you know, was up, up under Daniel Jones and Curtis Coleman. They just like it was almost like the same thing, Harry Hoosier and Richard Allen, their words, the purity of Methodism spoke to all the struggles I was going on in my life. It gave me clarity. And now I'm up against the same forces, basically, that assassinated Martin Luther King. Now they are in the Methodist Church in North Carolina. That was a difficult moment. Uh, I don't know whether you ever read John, uh, John Archibald. He's written a book, uh, Shaking the Gates of Hell. But he talks about that with his, with his father. He also talks about being in Decatur, Alabama in a, in a Cub Scout troop with some Negro named Outlaw who was his scout now. So I'm quite sure that's, you know, and that, they, that he didn't discuss um, uh, scouting with him. He discussed some other things. But, you know, that's, we'll deal with that another part. But, but where I'm going with this whole story is that that mindset existed that we as Negroes, black, because at that point we were not African American, were not qualified to be in the United Methodist Church. And this is in the late 1970s, 1980s. Some years later, a friend of mine moved to this city, and he was kind of my mentor guy when we were growing up. Everybody wanted to be like him. I'm not going to call his name because I think he comes to church here from time to time. <laughs> and, he, and he asked me, he, he heard I was in the law. He said, um, let me see how I tell the story, but I don't tell too much yet. He asked me about a particular bishop. And he said, well, what do you think about that bishop? I said, uh, so, you know, I said, do you remember Bill Davis? He said, yeah. I said, imagine him as a bishop. He said, oh my God, they still got them around? I said, yeah, I guess, you know, it, much has not changed. The mindset still had not gone away. Look what I'm about. Y'all didn't see the, the human in that story. <laughs> Okay. Many white congregations encouraged African American African members to leave and join churches better suited for them. Many former slaves joined the AME Church was an opportunity to express, to exercise freedom and liberty long denied. Many free men and women took their invisible religious institutions and placed over them a visible framework in the form of the AME Church. Uh, on that reading list is a book by uh, Albert Rabato uh, called Slave Rebellion. It talks about the invisible institution of the black church. The black church from, his, in, from slavery's ex, ex, uh, uh, coming into America, there always was a religious community, but it was known as the invisible institution because um, it, it had to be away from the slave master. So what's happening now is what was invisible out up under the trees now becomes visible in the framework of the AME church. The AME Church understood itself as elected by God to bring salvation and to uplift the unfortunate members of its race. That's the AME Church. Now we're going to deal with the AME Zion Church. The African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, AME Zion. The African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, AME Zion, or AME has its roots, keep in mind, the AME Church comes out of St. George in Philadelphia. The AME Zion Church has its roots coming out of John Street Church in New York City. One has its roots coming out of, out of Philadelphia, the other one has its roots coming out of John Street Church in New York City. As the size of the congregation at John Street Church increased, proper accommodations for, for white members made the presence of Africans problematic. Both St. George's Church in Philadelphia and St. and John Street Church decided on the same solution. <laughs> because what was happening is that African slaves were, 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 were being drawn to this message. So they began to see themselves as being a part of something that was radically different than what was going on in, outside the church. So Methodism, and keep in mind, John Wesley is still writing letters to these churches expressing, basically defining what Methodism is. 
He's still writing letters. So they saw this opportunity. So people were being drawn into these churches until it got to the point that Africans were outnumbering Europeans or Anglo-Americans in these congregations. Both St. John's churches and John Street Church decided on the same solution. Segregated seating and restricted access to important rituals and rites. Segregated seating and important restricted access to important rights and, and rituals. Peter Williams and others representing the African membership petitioned Francis Asbury. Francis Asbury is a bishop. Keep in mind he was the one that dedicates well, Bethel Church in Philadelphia. Now he's dealing with a similar situation with John Street Church in New York City. They petitioned Francis Asbury to hold a meetings, to hold regular meetings on their own beginning in 1796. See, because he, he has allowed this in 1794 to create Bethel Church. He ordained Richard Adams in 1794. So they're saying, well, you did it for them. Why not do the same thing for us? The request was approved, and four years later, Zion Church was built and incorporated as the African Methodist Episcopal Church of the city of New York. When another church developed with former Zion member William Miller preaching, the circuit was expanded to include both Zion and the new church called Asbury Church. Although controlled by their African membership, these churches remained under the jurisdiction of the Methodist Episcopal Church, led by John Street L. In other words, you got a separate church as we go back and we said, you can have your worship service, but you're still under the jurisdiction of an elder at John Street Church. In 1820, William Stilwell, the white elder responsible for Asbury and Zion churches, left due to the unfair financial arrangement between the dominant Methodist Church in New York, John Street, and other churches. This left Asbury and Zion without leadership. So Stilwell sees the inequity, the unfairness in this, and he said, I ain't going to do this no more. Either we're going to treat them equally, or I'm not participating in it. So that, so that didn't happen, so he just left the whole thing. Interested churches, interested churches from New York, Connecticut, yeah. interested churches from New York, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania, representing about 1,410 African American Methodists met in 1821 in New York and formed a new conference under the jurisdiction of the Methodist Episcopal Church. This new conference received no assistance from the Methodist Episcopal Church. They created a new conference, but they received no assistance. Now you know what they mean by assistance, though. No apportionment, none of the offerings coming to them. William Stilwell and two other white ministers ordained James Barrett, Abraham Thompson, and Levin Smith as elders in 1822. From the perspective of the Methodist Episcopal Church, African Methodists had severed their relationship through the development of their own Book of Discipline. In the eyes of the Methodist Episcopal Church, African Methodists had severed their relationship through the development of their own Book of Discipline, the doctrine and discipline of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in America. So since you create your own discipline, you own your own. We ain't gonna have nothing else to do with you. In 1824, the General Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church uh, made it clear that it would not support African Methodists who formed their own book of discipline and ordain their own members, ministers. The various churches met and formed the African Methodist Episcopal Church in America, who some sources say it was added in New York. The addition of Zion occurred in around 1848. To distinguish this group from the African Methodist Episcopal Church would have been formed earlier. Now I've always heard that that were these two churches both had the same name. Now I see where that comes from. So the, the distinction, because one is started at St. George, and another one started at St. St. George, and another one started at St. John. But they are beginning to develop and expand, and they create their own separate identity. One is African Methodist Episcopal Church, another is African Methodist Episcopal Church Zion. They will have their own conference, elect their own bishops. The name of the denomination was explained as representing the historical heritage 
of members in Africa and connected to John Wesley's Methodism. They wanted to maintain, that's why, because they were, they were referred to as Africans, because the word black is not, you know, was not known, and they wanted to maintain that heritage, and they wanted to be connected to John Wesley. Think about that, because John Wesley is being specific in terms of the way he feels Methodism should be going. But when it comes to America, somebody flips the script in terms of what Methodism is all about. Y'all getting mighty quiet. <laughs> Here are some early AME and AME Zion leaders. Some of these names may be familiar. Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, who was a leader and one of the founders of the Underground Railroad, Frederick Douglass, who many people say looks like me. <laughs> I don't look like him, he looks like me. And Denmark Vesey. Denmark Vesey in 1818, he helped found an independent AME congregation in Charleston, South Carolina. Today it is known as Mount, I'm sorry, today it is known as Mother Emmanuel AME Church. He was a pastor and a community leader who was accused and convicted of planning a major slave revolt in 1822. Denmark Beach. Why does the name Mother Emmanuel AME Church? Does that mean anything to y'all? Yes. Tell me what that means to you. Have you ever heard that name? For the shooting. Big part? Where there were shootings. Where the uh, uh, haven't there been shootings round off the way? <laughs> oh, a massacre. Oh, a massacre occurred at the church. And who was the person that perpetrated the massacre? What was his name? Dylan, Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof. Now, another aspect of this story that is that is making the rounds is the reason why Dylan Roof chose Mother Emmanuel and why it was so sacred. Denmark Vesey and others are alleged to and were hung in that sentence because they were they, they planned slavery revolt. And it was believed in the 1820s. That, then, uh, that Mother Emmanuel was, was the, keep in mind, we said earlier, the AME Church was what? A dangerous organization. Because it was focusing on, on what? Education and freedom. And many of their members uh, came pastors, took that freedom to the extent that America got its freedom. So then, because of that, the Citadel, how many of y'all heard of the Citadel? The Citadel was built not too far from Mother Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston. And its cannons were pointed at Mother Emmanuel. After Denmark V.C. was on. So Dylan's roots didn't just arbitrarily walk into Mother Emmanuel Church, but it's the history. The counts of the Citadel are pointed at this church. Well, you manage downtown. In other words, never again shall you attempt what Denmark V.C. attempted. That's just a little note from the GED section. <laughs> All right. Y'all get that? Well, I'm not going to say he did. He was unaware. The people in South Carolina are aware, both black and white, of this. Why the Citadel was created and why its cannons were pointed at Mother Man. So this is one of those stories you know, like the Clotilde. Everybody knows it. It's what they call it in, in Africa. It's a public secret. Everybody <laughs> knows it, but nobody talks about it. It's a public secret. Everybody knows it, but nobody talks about it. It's a public secret. Remember that. Say to the person next to you, it's a public secret. Public secret. It's a public secret. <laughs> All right. Now, we've dealt with the Methodist Church, what it advanced, its themes. We dealt with the separation of AME Church and AME Zion. Now let's get back to the, to the Methodist Episcopal Church and its position on slavery. And then we'll, we'll call it a day. The Methodist Episcopal Church and slavery. 
In his Thoughts on Slavery in 1774, John Wesley wrote, quote, I strike at the root of this complicated villainy. I absolutely deny all slaveholding to be consistent with any degree of natural justice. And I'm kind of abbreviated here. Much less is it possible that any child of man should ever be born a slave. Liberty is the right of any human creature as soon as he or she breathes the vital air and no human can deprive him or her of that right. This is a pamphlet, sermon, a document that Wesley wrote called Thoughts on Slavery. You can Google it. As one of my, as my uh, uh, Sidney Dumplin would say, Google it, brother, my law Google it. You can Google West, John Wesley's Thoughts on Slavery. This is just an excerpt of that. 1774. The Baltimore Conference was the first conference to raise the question about slavery. The Baltimore Conference. In 1780, the conference included question 17. Does this conference acknowledge that slavery is contrary to the law of God, man and nature, and hurtful to society? You know, there's, a, there's these questions, the disciplinary questions that, that are raised. So this was question 17. The answer is yes. Slavery in the beginning of Methodism was a moral matter, as we saw early on. Francis Asbury was against it, others were against it. Slavery had an ill effect upon persons enslaved, as well as upon the slaveholder. I guess um, my spell check didn't catch that one that time. I'm sorry. In 1783, the Methodist Society took action regarding slaveholding about holding local preachers accountable. Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury opposed slavery in the beginning. Remember, we talked about that earlier. In the beginning, Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury opposed slavery in the beginning. Some of these men compromised their views later as slavery became more entrenched and more profitable. Did you get that? Some of these men, because women were not making decisions at this point. Some of these men compromised their views later as slavery became more entrenched and more profitable. The Christmas Conference in 1784, the Methodist Church, uh, was prophetic on social issues in its first session. Question 42 was raised. What methods can we take to extirpate slavery? What methods can we take to extirpate slavery? Answer. We view it as contrary to the golden law of God, on which hang all the laws and the prophets and the inalienable rights of mankind. We therefore think that our bounden duty to take immediately some effectual method to extirpate this abomination from among us. 1784. This resolution was passed by the Christmas conference, but not unanimously. Many church members, local preachers, and even some of the itinerant preachers were opposed, were opposed to this resolution. With the, intervent, with the invention of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney, slavery became more entrenched. The great slave traders were from New England. The southern states began to develop a rationalization for slavery. Some argued slavery was part of the divine economy for Negroes, and they based this on scriptures in Genesis 9, 22, and verses 25 through 27, Ephesians 6 through 5, and Colossians 3, 22. In other words, it was the doctrine of providential design that God created Africans to be slaves and whites and Europeans to be masters. While slavery was becoming more institutionalized in the South, a new and a more aggressive anti-slavery movement was beginning in the North. By 1808, anything pertaining to slaveholding among members had been eliminated from the Book of Discipline. In 1784 was in the Book of Discipline, but by 1808, anything pertaining to slaveholding among members had been eliminated from the Book of Discipline. Slavery ceased to be a connectional interest within the Methodist Episcopal Church. But keep in mind, the AME Church strengthened its position 
it's anti-slavery position. But in the Methodist Episcopal Church, slavery ceased to be a connection of interest. Okay. Uh -huh. Good. A phrase in disciplinary language was, we declare that we are ever convinced of the great evil of slavery. It was put in the discipline of 1824 and remained in the discipline in eight, until 1860. In 1828, a resolution was presented to the General Conference providing that any slaveholder who treated his slave inhumanely, either by refusing him proper care or separation by means of purpose and sale of members of the family, should be brought to trial as in the case of immorality. The motion was placed on the table and never removed. The General Conference of 1836 and 1840, the issue of slavery and slaveholding uh, members intensified. At the General Conference of 1836 and 1840, the issue of slaveholding and slavery intensified. The bishops refused to place petitions dealing with slavery on the calendar of any annual conferences. Chew on that for me. Mm -hmm. The 1840 General Conference closed with no significant action on the slave question. The Southerners felt they had now buried the issue forever. Some felt it was a futile effort. A few withdrew from the church and formed the Wesleyan Methodist Church. That's where the Wesleyan Church comes from. How many of you heard of that? Uh, a friend of mine who's retired, I understand, has started a new church on the Eastern Shore, and several people who were once United Methodist clergy, my brothers in here who are clergy, they surrendered their credentials, and now they are part of the new Wesleyan Church on the Eastern Shore. I'm not calling any names. They ain't going to see a real mouth said that. Brother Adlaw, these this Wesleyan church was formed by slaveholders or abolitionists? I would think abolitionists in 18, yeah, 1840, yeah. The one on Eastern Shore, I'm not going to comment on, <laughs> <laughs> on their status. <laughs> but they're calling it Blank Wesleyan Church. That's as clean as I can say that. Since we're on TV here. <laughs> The memorable 1844 General Conference was convened at Green Street Church in New York City on May 1st, 1844. 33 annual conferences were present with 180 delegates. The Episcopal address was made with no mention of slavery. On May 20th, 1844, the Andrew case became before the General Conference from the Committee on Episcopals. Bishop James Andrews was a slave owner. He also had inherited slaves from his first and second marriages. I didn't know Bishop could have more than one wife. That's <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna stay out of that one. He, all, he had also inherited slaves from his first and second marriages, which Georgia law permitted him from uh, freeing. Some of the delegates felt unity was more important than the emancipation of slaves. In other words, do we want unity or do we want to uh, free slaves? Others believe that the owning of slaves was contrary to the law of God. The issue could not be resolved. So on June 1st, 1844, Bishop James Andrews was suspended from the Episcopacy of the Methodist Episcopal Church. After 60 years, the Methodist Episcopal Church divided into two denominations. The Methodist Episcopal Church South was located chiefly below the Mason-Dixon line, and the Methodist Episcopal Church North served the area above the Mason-Dixon line. And that kind of ends us for the day. Yeah, that's a good hour. I want to stop at this point. And if you have any thoughts or questions, we can take those. Michael, you can come forward here. You and I can, we don't have to be saying we can, you and I can do our thing right here. If in the, if in the course of 
that overview. You did have any questions that you wrote down, or if they're coming to your mind now, you write those on the sheets of paper that you have there and hold that up, and some of the members of our uh, racial justice and reconciliation team will pick those up and we will uh, talk through them. And I just want to start by saying thank you. That's a lot of ground that we covered, and uh, you did so uh, quickly and yet thoroughly. And uh, a lot of the questions that come to my mind are not, I guess, so much on the particulars of what you said as the implications of them. So uh, if left to my own devices, that's where some of these questions will go. Uh, but we'll give just a moment for, uh, for individuals to finish writing down any questions you might have. And I'll let you done so if you want to hold them up. Uh, that would be wonderful. Jamie Blake has a question. <laughs> I am so overwhelmed with information that I do not know that I don't know enough to ask a question. But I need to read several books. Did I see I hear Mr. Harris with that question over there? How many numbers do we lose that went to A and E, A and E lines? I don't have that in front of me now. Uh you know back then, yeah, uh I'm going to catch up on that next week, but on, the, on that sheet, it will talk about how to have one right now. In terms of lost numbers, I don't know whether we can pull that up because, you know, but I was making a great attempt, but I, I, I don't have that in For those online or the north side of the building, uh, the question was how many individuals went from the Methodist Episcopal Church to the new reform A and B and A and B do you have any questions to come forward? If not, then you just leave it in my hands. I got one okay. here. James, do you have a question? I thought I saw you had one. Always have a question last week. Okay. Uh, question was, and I remember the moment you said, and even uh, itinerant preachers. Uh, so the question is, why was it surprising uh, that itinerant preachers supported slavery? Uh, were there particular groups? Uh, Within the the Methodist organization, the Methodist Episcopal organization, that uh, we might have expected to be more supportive of uh, a free church or less supportive of that. I was trying to find this. I wrote something down earlier, and I can't I can't find my phone. But anyhow, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. How many of y'all, there was this series called Black Sales? I know y'all don't watch TV, but y'all prepare for me. Um, so I, I watch all this on God stuff. But on, on this the series called Black Sales, on, this series called Black Sales, that word. series called Black Sales, um, there's this point which is dealing with piracy and the, uh, the breakaway of the Caribbean and the colonists from Europe, as well as with the, uh, 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 the slaves, maroon, that's it, the, the maroon colonies that are in the, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, the maroon, which, are, which became the fighting maroon, which uh, Morehouse College that's what they call themselves the fighting movement. No, these are people who were against slavery and were for free. But there's a line in there that says something like this. It says, labor fuels our commerce, and our commerce fuels our security, and cheap labor fuels our ultimate security. Labor fuels our commerce, and our commerce fuels our security, and cheap labor fuels our ultimate security. So this is an outlawism. In order to fuel your security to the highest level, you need a cheap labor. And the cheapest labor that was available were slaves, because indentured servants could work them and slaves, and this became so apparent in the movie 12 Years of a Slave, I'm glad I didn't see that when it first came out. Y'all saw that movie? In that all of these people had grown up free, the, the, the black guys, the white women, they, 
they, they were in each other's societies, clubs, and they, they were equals. But this one group of, of, uh, of Americans had created an indebtedness. Stay with me on this. And in order to satisfy their indebtedness, they sold their black friend into slavery to settle their debts. It is said that Thomas Jefferson, you know, at his, what's the name of the place? He grew up in Monticello, Mount Vernon, one of them. Yeah, one of them. And he got to the point that, you know, after he left the presidency, he almost became bankrupt, and the only way he could get out of debt was to what? what? That's right. And they were crying to him and saying, wait a minute, you, you were going to set us free, but he had paid his debt off. So, oftentimes, people living a certain lifestyle, the only collateral they had was humans who were enslaved. So then local preachers, that was a, that was a status symbol. How many, how many slaves you had? Similarly, the backstory on Bishop James Andrews, when they asked him the question, are you going to release your slaves? He said, they don't belong to me, they belong to my wife. So this is uh, a, a circular discussion, or something, yeah. But uh, uh, having slaves was your collateral in case you were in need of some funds. You could just loan your slaves out, and sell your debt, or you could sell them and make a profit. I don't know if that answers the question, though. <laughs> And sure, we don't have to go right. One of the questions that you uh, that came to my mind in what you were describing it and what you laid out for us, uh, the very first thing that really just lodged in me with what you laid out for us is the fact that none of it seems like it was inevitable, uh, and that the, the narrative you've given us to me really calls into a question. I think an assumption of progress. I think it's easy to fall into an idea that, uh, well, the next decade is inevitably building on the one before and that we just get wiser, we just learn things, we just get better. Yet, as you describe it, we, we start with the Methodist movement in America with real possibility in terms of uh, the welcoming of, of African preaching into the church and, and congregations where uh, it is far from... Uh, the kingdom of the fullness of the kingdom of God, but there's there is uh, opportunities for mutual uh, worship. But we are we're such backsliders. Go yeah, ahead. And then yes, exactly. The the, the, the Methodist conference in 1780 can make such a stronger statement than it can 50 years later, and uh, it calls into question some of those those uh, question those ideas of progress. And I don't have a much better question than. What are your thoughts on progress, on, uh, on notions that uh, we are inevitably climbing upwards, or uh, what do you think makes the difference in those moments uh, that cause us sometimes to backslide? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it causes me, what the songwriter said, to tremble. <laughs> to tremble. And it is that tradition that sustains us, those of us of color as well as people who've been uh, suppressed, uh, oppressed, isolated, abandoned, alone, you have been, is that you reckon, you come to the realization that even though today is not the day that you want it to be, we live to fight another day. I think Bob Marley, in one of my, uh, I, I, he has his song, he said, you know, he that fights and runs away, he lives to fight another day. And the heathen bandits won the war. And the heathen bandits won the war. So sometimes you have to, you know, uh, I think it was Machiavelli. Well, then my son said, no, it was Sun Tzu. I said, well, Sun Tzu got it from somebody else. Right? <laughs> uh, no, he says it's Machiavelli, I said it's Sun Tzu. Wait a minute, wait a But I was taught this when I was in Tuskegee. A fellow said that when you outnumber, you have to retreat. When you're equal strength, you have to negotiate. When you outnumber the enemy, you have to attack. When you outnumber, you retreat. When you're equal strength, you negotiate. When you outnumber the enemy, you know, you attack. And that may be, I'm not expanding, just giving you analogies here. That may be what's going on now with Ukraine and Russia. I mean, Ukraine, Russia, and the United States. You know, who's outnumbered, who's equal strength, who's going to attack. So similarly, these um, battles we see being displayed out in, in the world, 
they, they find themselves having great expression within the church. It's who has the majority. So in 1844, it was that abolitionists had the majority of votes. So when the southern states realized they were outvoted, outnumbered, they pulled out. But keep in mind, their main concern was who could own slaves. Slavery was not an issue for the southern. Because it was their, and I finally found that statement. It was there, uh, I like Captain Flint, I know y'all don't watch that kind of stuff. But here it is, it says, uh, for labor fuels commerce, commerce fuels security. Cheap labor produces, uh, produces commerce, and commerce guarantees our security. Labor fuels commerce, commerce fuels security. Cheap labor produces commerce, and commerce guarantees our security. Now, that was being said in the battle between the, the, the breakaway pirates, uh, who were robbing ships from England and also robbing ships from America, the runaway slaves and all this group, they came together in the Caribbean and they didn't want to be a part of none of these things, but it was, it, it was, it, it, it was the, the, the Cuban government, the American government, and the English who wanted to get rid of me. He said, well, the main thing we got to deal with, all these maroons have pulled away from these plantations. The whole issue was, you know, we need cheap labor. And we can't get it. So, similarly, if we can live, and this, I'm getting down the road here, I'm maybe a little treacherous. What we're witnessing now in America is the rise of a new kind of nationalism, Christian, what, Christian right, or evangelism, that wants to create a separate nation. It doesn't want to be inclusive. They want to pull out and create a separate nation. Now, it's similar to what that went on in the church in 1844, and I forgot to mention it, and 17 years later, America split over that same issue of slavery. So if the Methodist Church had resolved this in 1844, as I say, could the Civil War have been averted? So even if we have these, these are not microaggressions, these are macroaggressions. We live with these macroaggressions continually that we have, those of us in the middle want to go forward but we got the left and the right that make money off of these issues. Now I know I've gotten way away from your question. <laughs> and yet you led right into uh, the yeah. last one that I had. And, um, before I ask that, before we get the answer, I'll remind everyone we have the table in the back. We'd love for you to linger to ask the smaller questions, the how are you doing questions, and the, oh, I didn't want to ask this for everybody. Yeah, but, well, it, 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 but, but the, you asked about uh, hope. But the hope is that we will build the kingdom, that the kingdom of God will come from heaven to earth. Now. Mm -hmm. that, that's the hope. Mm -hmm. That's what we live for now. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, you can say that all day. Yeah. <laughs> no, Last said, question for today is um, thinking about the, that division in the Methodist Church and its implications uh, for the nation. Uh, one of the things I couldn't resolve in my mind mm -hmm. as you were speaking that I'd love to speak to where you are in it is on the question of church discipline. There is a part of me that when you describe a church that is able to say to one of its bishops, you have to get, you have to um, free your slaves, you cannot be a slave holding bishop, a church that is looking to, to make it a question of membership, there is a part of me that wants to stand up and cheer and say, I want a church that has Christians in it who believe, um, mm -hmm. who live out their faith, and that holds each other accountable. I want that strong accountability mm -hmm. and that strong church discipline that holds people to account. And you also describe a church where uh, African worshipers are grateful to be apart from the overly watchful eyes of slave owners. And I, it's not hard for me to see very quickly how that church discipline could go wrong uh, and how that strong, authoritative church could fall into uh, uh, power to people that, uh, that, that may not be leading us into holiness. Mm -hmm. And I think we've, we, I don't know how many of you all follow this, but. The Amazon church kind of fall into one of those situations that recently. Yeah. So one of our colleagues uh, once said to me that if we lose our discipline as Methodists, we lose our power. Yeah. That it is our ability to kind of work together mm -hmm. uh, and to, to be on the same page with things. Uh, but we are also aware that the misuse of that discipline can, can lead to suppression and oppression. And what do you think uh, after your years in ministry, what do you think a good, healthy church discipline looks like? I think it was Bishop uh, Scott Jones, is that his name? 
uh, his father's position that he taught at uh, Perkins and now he's a bishop. Uh, several years ago, he began to do a blog. I know what a blog was. He began to do a blog, and he titled his blog, The Extreme Center. The Extreme Center. And I'm convinced that's what Methodism is about. How do we hold both the left and the right, the, the progressive uh, and the conservative, the evangelical, uh, and you know, how do you hold the, the evangelicalism in one hand and the social gospel in, in another hand? It, it is that dynamic tension. It is that dynamic tension that I'm convinced Methodism gives us the opportunity to achieve. I think it was E. Stanley Jones from going back to 1973, 74, my days sitting in there in the classroom at this college, that E. Stanley Jones said that I am conservative in my faith, but I'm radical in my application. I'm conservative in my faith, but I'm radical in my application. And I think that's where people, on one hand, they want to talk about the doctrine and they want to talk about what it is we must do and they come up with all the no's, what they are against, but you never hear what they are for. That same thing, that same thread runs through politics. You got one group, they're against this. What are you for? Several years ago, I think it was under the Reagan administration, when they, the war on drugs, they were saying, just say no. Okay, if we're saying no over here, what are we saying yes to? So I'm convinced that you can have that if we're going to put restrictions in one place, then we need to acknowledge what is it that we what is it that we're going to do? And that's the balance. And I think that's what Wesley uh, what was all about. Yeah, we have to balance our strong position. Well, keep in mind, we said earlier, Methodism was not based on strong doctrinal statements. But we have brought that in because of the culture and because, I hate to go back to it, because of commerce, as we said earlier, a lot of Methodist preachers were against slavery. Uh, but as it became more profitable, Remember that? I'll go back to that slide. As things become more profitable, let me go back to black sales here. Uh, labor fuels our commerce. Commerce fuels our security. Cheap labor produces commerce, and commerce guarantees our security. So we find ourselves now that we are, we are, we are allowing the tail to wag the dog. We're allowing society to dictate what it is we should and should not do. You know, and that, that, that's the dilemma that we're in because on one side we say, you know, Jesus said this, but then what we shouldn't do, and then we come back and say, uh, well, we don't talk about what we can do. But I don't, you know, I think Jesus was a veil. Keep in mind, he got in trouble with the Pharisees because they wanted him over here, and he said, no, I've been sent to do this. And so they said, wait, wait, well, you got to go. Isn't that something? When you began to talk about uh, the balance, that's, I think, that balance thing. Let me see what I do. When, when, when you can balance that thing, yeah, there you go. The balance. See, I can't do it. It's hard to do. <laughs> but it's, it's when we can hold both sides in dynamic tension. But we need we need we need both. You know, we, we need to talk about you know what it is that God has called us to do, but we also need to deal with the realities of those the, the least fortunate, the less fortunate. I think Moses and Jesus both said, the poor you always have with you, and whatever you can take need of. See on one side now, now I'm getting real political. Now we got this thing in the legislature where they want to fund, give people the funds to send their kids to private school. We're gonna take federal money and send kids to private, they, they call that what? parental choice. But what that's going to cause is because here again, in Alabama, you quote me on this TV, we'll watch it. <laughs> we don't want to fund public education. We want to privatize education. We want to privatize health care. And we want to privatize child care. We want to privatize everything out there. Y'all getting real quiet on that. 
Yeah, go ahead. Child care for residents privatizes. You can see what a mess that is. Yeah, right. But see, and see, the next one is you know is K through twelve education. And my children are in Montgomery and uh, uh, Montgomery County School System. Strangely enough, and I'm told this movement was led by Memphis people. If you are white or athletic, black, Asian, or Native American, you go to private school. If you white, poor, ain't got no money in black, you go to the public school. You got a segregated system in Montgomery County. And strangely enough, when systems drop under 70% white, you will notice the, the revenue streams drop. Uh, I'm getting in deep water here now, I just hope I'm not falling to the house. In uh, Jefferson County school systems like um, Mount Brook, West Stadium, and North Shelby County, basically are public schools where they raise their own taxes, property tax, to fund the education. They kids go to public school. My kids go to Pike Road School now. And uh, I didn't know this until I dropped my, son off, my grandson off a football practice one day in, in Pike Road's his new community. But it's really in front of the, what is it called? Pike Road High School, which is old George Washington uh, Junior High Elementary School with in Montgomery County. Right in front of it is the First Baptist Church. And on their sign, Michael, you all check this out. Yeah, right, you Montgomery. The First Baptist Church got on their sign the First Baptist Church of Mount Meigs. And I, it dawned on me, I said, that's right, Mount Meigs was unincorporated. Pike Road was unincorporated. But now they've incorporated uh, Pike Road and they've taken in Wall, Old Pike Road, where black folk used to live, and, and created this town of Pike Road. So now they can raise revenue through property tax to support their schools. Now, I have no property school system. You know, I, my son and grandchildren, we went to the state championship football game. We won. I appreciate that. <laughs> like I told my son, you know, hey. You just stopped them before. <laughs> <laughs> As I show you, my son, you know, he's supposed to be the next thing. He's supposed to be the next great running back. Grandson's supposed to be the next great running back of basketball player at the University of Alabama. So, you know, I got to watch what I say about this stuff. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. We got two more weeks to get into deep waters. I'm not too worried about us falling off or falling in too deep. I appreciate your willingness to be here, to keep asking those questions, to keep learning. And uh, we can come back to what we heard today. Wasn't that a wonderful thing to hear? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we can speak to the next day. We might still be a little while before we know what questions to ask. Hope you'll come back next week. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'll be back. Jamie is going to make sure I'm coming. Can we close with a prayer before we dismiss right. the, the refreshments in the back? Lord Jesus, we thank you for continuing to nourish us, body, soul, and spirit. And we pray that we might truly feast on what we have heard today that we might be able to find it in all that you are giving us to sustain and even strengthen our faithfulness to you, the communities around us, and above all, our witness. Yes. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. I know I won the round of worship. Please forgive me. Y'all pray for me.